All right, good evening, everybody. Welcome to Calvary Chapel, Fredericksburg. Just want to welcome those who are here and welcome those who may be at home uh, watching and listening on uh, internet land. Uh, thank you for all for coming tonight. So uh, first off, real quick, as everybody takes their seats, uh, does anybody need a Bible? Because we are going to be definitely moving around our Bible tonight. So if you need a Bible, please raise your hand and uh, Chuck back there will hand one to you if you need one. And if you have your Bibles, why don't you go ahead and open to Matthew chapter 18. We'll be in Matthew chapter 18 tonight. So as uh, many of you know, uh, Pastor Mark was away for the last week, and so he should be back, uh, arriving back in town today. So I was asked uh, with the responsibility and privilege of being up here tonight uh, to teach, so I'm looking forward to it. And what we're going to be talking about tonight and what I titled this lesson is Unmerited Mercy. We're going to be talking about God's mercy. And as we'll know, and as you may know already, God's mercy is, is huge. It's, it's so huge that we can't even fathom it. So what we're going to do is we're going to actually go into a parable in Matthew 18 tonight and talk about how Jesus taught us about God's mercy. So if you can, open your Bibles to Matthew 18, and we'll be in verses 21 to 35. And I'll start off by reading our verses first for tonight. So this is the parable of the unforgiving servant. And starting in verse 21. Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all they had, and that the payment be made. The servant therefore fell down before him, saying, Master, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. Then the master of the servant was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him the debt. But the servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And he laid hands on him, and he took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you all. And he would not, but went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what had been done, they were very grieved and came and told their master all that had been done. Then his master, after he had called him, said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all the debt because you begged me. Should you not also have compassion on your fellow servant, just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to be torturers until he should pay all that was due to him. So my heavenly father will also do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. And the key word there is from his heart, if you want to underline that. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just... Thank you for this opportunity tonight to study your word, Lord, to be in your word. Help us, Lord, just to hear you speak to us, Lord. Guide our hearts, Lord, to draw near to you, Lord. Help us to see your mercy even more clear than we see it now, Lord. Bless what we're doing, Lord. Speak to us individually as a congregation, Lord, and just bless your word tonight. Father, we also want to lift up those in Florida as, they, as the Hurricane Ian is approaching, Lord. We just... Put all those people in your hands. I know many have loved ones and friends down there and all those are there, Lord. So we pray that you keep them safe, Lord, that you give wisdom to the leaders there to handle this crisis, Lord. May you provide the supplies that are needed to restore and be with those that are first responders, those that will restore power, those that will provide food and water to those that need it, Lord. Bless their travels and be with them. And we pray this to you in Jesus' name, amen. So as I said, tonight, we'll be discussing God's mercy, specifically what God's mercy is and how we as followers of Christ should have that same spirit of mercy manifested in our lives. So maybe some of you as kids maybe have cried out, mercy, mercy, when somebody got you in some kind of submissive hold and held you down. Uh, sometimes people would say uncle. I never got why people said uncle, but that's, that's for another day. But, uh, you know, may, or maybe some of you were the ones holding somebody down and making them cry mercy to you. I won't judge you. That's all right. But, uh, you know, maybe that's happened. But it's basically you got somebody in a submissive position. Maybe, maybe, maybe some of you have heard of mercy rules in sports. I know in youth sports and some amateur sports, there is what's considered a mercy rule, 
which basically gives compassion to a team that is, how would you put it, losing pretty badly. So it gives the uh, a winning team maybe more difficulty to score or to uh, uh, be in a position to, to dominate the game. I know my daughter plays across, and unfortunately, and fortunately, I've seen both sides of the mercy roll of their games where either they've received it or they were the ones that were uh, dominating something else. But speaking of mercy, I found this little story on the Internet that kind of really highlights it. And it's about uh, the Emperor Napoleon. And it says, a mother once approached Napoleon seeking a pardon for her son. The emperor replied that the young man had committed a certain offense twice, and justice demanded death. But I don't ask for justice, the mother explained. I plead for mercy. But your son does not deserve mercy, Napoleon replied. Sir, the woman cried, it would not be mercy if he deserved it. And mercy is all I ask for. Well then, the emperor said, I will have mercy. And he spared the woman's son. Now, looking that up, I don't know if that story is true or not, but uh, it definitely I found it in multiple spots, but it does a good example of mercy. And the Oxford language definition of mercy is compassion or forgiveness shown towards someone whom it is, this one, one, whom it is one's power to punish or harm over. So that's what mercy is. So in common usage, we routinely hear grace and mercy used together. You know, they appear to be interchangeably used together. Biblically, however, that's not necessarily the case. Uh, They are definitely related, uh, but consider them basically as we look at a coin, as a quarter here, mercy on one side, grace on the other. You know, they go together, but they're two different things in God's plan for salvation. When God saves a person, he extends both mercy, mercy and grace. Mercy is forgiving someone, the sinner, and withholding the punishment that they justly deserve. Grace, however, is the stacking undeserved blessings upon that sinner or the unmerited favor God gives that sinner once they grant mercy. So in salvation, God does not show one without the other. And in Christ, uh, salvation, the believer receives both mercy and grace as it looks in Christ here. So not only in the Bible is mercy granted to the confessed sinner in the form of forgiveness, God can also grant it in mercy for people who are suffering in the forms of healings or other comforts. And a a good example of that, as we see in the Bible, is in Matthew 20, verse 30. You know, there were two blind men who cried out to Jesus for mercy. They wanted healing of their eyes. And then in verse 34, Jesus, in in an act of compassion, granted them that mercy and healed them of, of their blindness. So in any case, mercy can be characterized as compassionate treatment for those in distress. Whether the stress is caused by the guilt or the penalty of sin or by some kind of incapacitating physical condition, God's mercy is there to help. So as we go through the Bible, and for those of you who uh, are good Bible scholars, there are an abundant amount of examples and verses displaying and explaining and living out God's mercy. You know, as we know God, God is, is many things. If we look at God's characteristics, God is love. You know, God is just. God is faithful. You know, God is omnipresent. God is omnipotent. But God is also merciful. And that is something God definitely is. So as we go into our verses tonight in Matthew 18, I first want to start off by quoting A.W. Tozer. And A.W. Tozer stated this, Mercy is not something God has, but is something God is. So let's start by looking at our verses here in verses 21 to 22. And I'll read. Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. So Peter here starts by asking Jesus a question. How many times should he forgive somebody who maybe who sinned against him? Who did him wrong? Now, as we always look at the Bible and ask, why is this being said? So we get some perspective here. Let's go back a few verses and summarize what Jesus had just told his disciples here. Summarizing what happened before verse 21. So in verses 15 to 18, Jesus talks about how Christians, and the church specifically, should deal with those who have potentially sinned against them. And to help settle quarrels and misunderstandings and bring about repentance to the one who might have offended somebody when they sinned. Then in verses 19 to 20, Jesus states how the church should strive to have agreement and unity with each other in prayer 
before the Lord, as he will be there with them. This is what the unrepentant person would miss then, that unity in prayer as the Lord is with two as they pray. So now Peter kind of in light of that conversation of what Jesus stated about unity, agreement, and repentance, tried to sound here extremely loving and reasonable. So to explain, most Jewish rabbis at the time taught that forgiving somebody who was an unrepentant sinner against you or somebody who might have did you wrong, the correct way to do it is up to three times. So after three times, that's the right thing to do. You know, what would happen after the third time? I don't know. I guess you, you gave them a chance and then they would uh, no longer forgive you. Yet, but they taught three times. So Peter here then asked Jesus if he should give up the, forgive up to seven times. So instead of three times, Lord, how about we forgive up to seven times? Peter here might have been thinking that he was showing, you know, great love and compassion and faith, you know, more than doubling to three times that the, uh, the Jewish rabbis had taught back then. But Jesus then answers Peter in verse 22 and states, seven times, Peter? No, 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 no. How about 70 times seven? Or for those of you who are mathematicians, that would be 490 times is what he's saying. So you probably ask yourself, right, how can we keep track of forgiving somebody 490 times? Like if I get to like 280, I got, oh man, I have like another 210 times to forgive somebody or what happens after the 491st time? Do I now don't have to forgive him anymore? Well, that's kind of what the point Jesus was making there. There is no set number of times to forgive somebody. There is no limit. Love, grace, and mercy are not recorded and tracked by numbers. So if we even get close to forgiving somebody that many times, if you're out forgiving somebody for the 101st time, you're really going to create our, for ourselves a, a good habit and pattern of forgiveness you know, you, as you kind of condition yourself to do that. Now, we had a uh, pastor in California, and he used to say this all the time, and it used to kind of make me chuckle at first, but then I, I kind of got it. He used to say, you know, I like you. You make me flex my grace muscle. And he would say this to somebody who would maybe, you know, challenge him or, or maybe somebody kind of got under his skin a little bit, but he said, you know, you make me flex my grace muscle. And that's really what forgiveness is in a lot of aspects and mercy. The more we do it, the more that muscle gets conditioned to do it. And that's what Jesus is saying here. You know, not seven times, Peter, you know, 70 times, seven times. Condition that grace muscle to forgive. Make it stronger and stronger. So as we look in Ephesians chapter four, verses 31 to 32, it states, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, either as, even as God in Christ forgave you. So if we attempt, attempt to be forgiving and merciful as God is to us, we will bring about an atmosphere in the church of love, of forgiveness. This will allow the Holy Spirit to bring out the best in us, and it will also allow the Holy Spirit to work in the person who maybe sinned against us or did wrong, if we are merciful and graceful as, as we are. Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 to 14 state, Therefore, as the elect of God, and it's talking to the church here, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. So as Jesus tells Peter about forgiving 490 times, he then moves into a parable starting in verse 23 to put his point through. So as we go through this parable, you're going to see three stages of the servant. And each stage, the servant has something different as it, re as it responds to mercy in his life and, and his walk with the Lord. So the first one, as we look through verses 23 to 27, we're going to call it the debtor seeking mercy. So let's read 23 to 24 first. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. So as you can see here, Jesus starts out by saying, therefore, and as we always say, when he says it's therefore, it's, it's therefore a reason for us. You know, it's for us to listen and to heed and to take note of this. Jesus relates this parable directly to the kingdom of heaven. The king in this parable 
as we can see, is someone who expected his servants to be faithful, to be honorable. If they owed a debt to the king, they should have known that the king would one day call that debt to be paid and called in. Now the king here wanted all the accounts of those who owed him paid up to date and settled. So a man was brought before him that owed him a lot. And speaking of a lot, he owed him 10,000 talents. So to put that into perspective in today's uh, monetary value, um, I got ranges of 10,000 talents anywhere from $12 million to up to $1 billion in today's money. So somewhere in that range is that amount, and it's a pretty high debt to owe. So it appears to be obviously an unpayable debt here to this servant, something this man can never afford to pay off and settle his account with the king. So now going to verses 25 to 27, it says, But as he was not able to pay his master, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all that he had, and that payment be made. The servant therefore fell down before him, saying, Master, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him his debt. Now, as we look here, as the man was confronted with payment of his debt in full, he was unable to pay it. The debt before the king was way so too much as we talked about for him to afford. He owed the king much more than he can afford. The debt before the king would destroy him and his family. It was huge. So since he could not pay the king, what did he do? For, well, the master first ordered that his man, the man, his wife, and his kids be sold off into slavery or debtor's prison. So that was the first thing the king was going to do to settle this debt. So if you look back at that day, the top, top price for a, a slave, and this was the very few that would get it, would be maybe one talent, and that would be the top. Most likely, people sold off would get one-tenth of that or even less in money. So that's the first thing the master was going to do. Second, the master ordered all they possessed to be sold. The picture here is to sell, show us that even selling them into slavery, selling all their possessions, would not even be close to settling the debt the man owed to the king. However, doing this would be some measure of justice. The servant owed the king way more than he can ever, ever provide back. It appears the man's case before the king was hopeless. There's no way that the man could pay it off. So what did the servant do? Well, in desperation before the king, he fell on his knees before the master and asked for patience and a promise that he will pay off the debt. Now, how would he pay it off? It doesn't say. But what it, do, it, it does not say that, but the economy back then, if a, if a common man would have labored for, let's say, 20 years, he may be able to work and earn one talent. So there was just no way he could do it. No amount of patience given would even have allowed the man to pay off his debt. So Spurgeon stated this about these verses. Many a poor sinner is very rich in resolutions. This servant debtor thought he only needed patience, but indeed he needed forgiveness. The master then did something that was not expected. He showed compassion on the servant on the man and gave him mercy. The king assumed a loss to himself and forgave the debt that was owed to the man. The man and his family were now free from the debt and they were released with an act of kindness and mercy from the king. They would not be punished. They would not be sold into slavery, put in the debtor's prison, and they would be free to go. Now the servant here did not deserve the mercy and forgiveness from the master, but the master did this as an act of love, as an act of compassion, as he did on the person here. As the king had forgiven the man so much, we must look at this as God has forgiven us for so much also. God, through his love for us, granted mercy on all those who have asked and repented of the multitude of sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Psalms 51 verses 1 to 2 states this. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Paul writes in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 15 to 16. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. However, for this reason, I obtain mercy, that in me, 
first Jesus Christ might show all long suffering as a pattern. Key word there is a pattern if you want to underline that. To those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. So now you would think here, right? We get to the parable that should have ended right here. The, the servant was forgiven. He was let go. Everything is great. You know, he would have changed his life. He would have been a humble person, uh, full of joy, and realized that, you know, he just got away with one of the most merciful things that he could ever get in his life, an act of love. But it's not the case. And as we'll see in the upcoming verses, although the man wanted and accepted the king's mercy, he himself was not willing to grow and learn from it. And he was not willing to give out mercy. And it was basically only receiving it one way, and that was for himself. So now as we go on to verses 28 to 30, we'll call this section a creditor lacking mercy. So let's read 28 to 30. But the servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat saying, pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him saying, have patience with me and I will pay you all. And he would not, but went and threw him into prison till he should pay his debt. So upon leaving the king, the servant goes and he finds this another servant that owed him a hundred denarii. So if you want to put it into uh, equality of what a talent and denarii is, a denarii was about one day's wage. So 100 denarii, about 100 days wages there. So this was not a small amount by far. It was a pretty good amount. However, in comparison to what the servant owed the king, 100 denarii were approximately one six hundred thousandths of what he owed the king and what he had owed on that. So obviously way more on this side than on this side. So instead of rejoicing and sharing in the mercy uh, he just received, the servant took the man by the throat. He actually grabbed the man by the throat, as Jesus tells us, and demanded immediate payment. The man who owed the smaller debt then asked the servant for the same thing he'd asked the king for recently. He said, have patience with me, and I will pay you off. However, the unforgiving servant, as we'll start calling him now, because that's what he became, was unwilling to grant to others what he wanted others to grant to him. Instead, he threw the man into debtor's prison until he could pay off his debt. Now, if you look at the law back then, he had the legal right to do this, but the unforgiving servant by no means had the moral right to do this. He had been forgiven himself for way more. He and his family would be, you know, basically suffering right now, but they were spared by the king. Shouldn't he have done the same thing? You know, it's amazing to see how a person, you know, can ask for and receive mercy from God, but then not be able to apply that same mercy to someone else in their life, even for the smallest of things, you know, or even hypocritically, the same situation you might be in or might have had been in. And so, we, you know, it's, it's just amazing to see that. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 7, as Jesus was delivering the Beatitudes, he stated, Blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy. And then also in Luke chapter 6, verse 36, Jesus said, therefore be merciful, just as your father is also merciful. We are commanded by the Lord to duplicate God's mercy given towards us, towards others. You know, God God commands us to do that. And in fact, if we look at Micah chapter 6, verse 8, it tells us what the Lord exactly wants us to do. And it states, he has shown you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justly to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God when the Lord had presented us with this opportunity to give mercy and forgiveness to others are we walking justly are we walking humbly and are we doing it with mercy in these situations or can we potentially be like that unforgiving servant Proverbs chapter 11 verse 7 states the merciful man does good for his own soul, but he who is cruel troubles his own flesh. So let's let's see what happens here now as we go into our last part of our verses here. Verses 31 to 35. We'll call this section now for our unforgiving servant, the judgment of the merciless. So let's read verses 31 to 34 to start. So when his fellow servants saw what had been done, they were very greed. 
and came out and told their master all that had been done. Then his master, after he had called him, said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant, just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he could pay all that was due to him. So first notice here, there's no mention here by Jesus in the parable that the unforgiving servant felt guilty or felt convicted in any way of what he just did to the other person that owed him a debt. There was no conscious in him um, or behavior uh, of, of grief on this, that he's put this person into prison. No. Who told the king? It was the fellow servants who saw that. They were grieved, and they were basically probably outraged and reported the injustice to the king. David Guzik stated this, Sometimes we are painfully and to our embarrassment blind to our own sinful fleshly conduct. When the master heard about what happened, he was naturally very angry. At the, you know, looking at the double standard of this unforgiving servant. The king called out the unforgiving servant, telling him, hey, you know what, I had compassion on you. Should you have not had compassion and mercy on your fellow servant? The king then throws him into debtor's jail to be tortured, just as the unforgiving servant had done to the servant that owed him money. The king is basically saying, hey, so you want to live and judge others by the law without mercy? Then you know what? I will judge you by that same law. I will do to you what you did to others. The king now gave the unforgiving servant justice instead of mercy, just as the unforgiving servant did to the person who owed him. Now, as we go to the Bible, the Bible clearly cautions us on being judgmental and not applying mercy in our life. Jesus stated this in Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 to 2. Judge not that you be not judged, for with what judgment you judge you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And James chapter 2, verse 13 states this. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over justice. Let me read that again. For justice is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over justice. So, you know, as we look at this in this, in this parable, and we look through the Bible, there are many stories and examples of the Bible of God's mercy, God's love, God's compassion, and how it played out on those throughout the whole Bible. But one prominent person I want to talk about tonight and share with you about is Joseph. So if you could turn in your Bibles to Genesis 45. So let's go far, far left here. We're going to go out to Genesis. If you can also keep Matthew 18 marked in your Bibles because we'll be going back there as we finish up but Genesis 45. So as you're turning there, you know, as you may know, Joseph's story starts in Genesis 30. He is the first son of Jacob from his beloved wife, Rachel. And it picks up again in Genesis 37. And, and Joseph's story is then the major theme for the remainder of Genesis, Joseph's life. Now, Joseph was despised by his brothers. They were jealous of him. And he was sold into slavery. And while a slave for a very powerful man in Egypt... He was accused of a crime he didn't commit and was thrown in prison to rot. Joseph, being a strong man of faith in the Lord, continued to walk honorably during his time before the Lord. In Genesis 41, Pharaoh had a disturbing dream and he did not, he did not know the meaning of it and it troubled him. But Pharaoh's chief butler remembered Joseph from his time in prison and told Pharaoh that Joseph could be somebody that could interpret his dream. So God here then gave Joseph the gift to interpret Pharaoh's dream, that there would be seven years of abundant crops in, e in Egypt, followed by seven years of famine in the land. The Pharaoh was so happy to hear his dream interpreted that he made Joseph the most, basically the second most powerful man in Egypt behind Pharaoh to administer the affairs of Egypt and prepare Egypt for the coming drought and famine that was going to hit. So now let's go to Genesis 45. So after Joseph's brothers were sent by their father, to purchase food during the famine, Joseph gathers his brothers at his house to let them know who he really is. The younger brother that, he, that was sold off by them into slavery and was now the second most powerful man in Egypt, one of the greatest powers in the world at that time. So let's read Genesis chapter 45, verses 1 through 8. And it states, 
Then Joseph could not restrain himself before all those who stood by him. And he cried out, make everyone go out from me. So no one stood with him while Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept aloud, and the Egyptians and the house of Pharaoh heard it. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Does my father still live? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed in his presence. And Joseph said to his brothers, Please, come near to me. So they came near. And then he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. But now, do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves, because you sold me here, for God sent me before you to preserve life. For these two years the famine has been in the land, and there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. And God had sent me before you to preserve a prosperity for you and the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now, it was not you who sent me here, but God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his house and a ruler through all out the land of Egypt. So as you look here, as Joseph made himself known to his brothers, it states in verse 3 that they were dismayed and could not speak when they found out who he really was. If you look at the word dismayed in the word Hebrew, it means amazed, frightened, or terrified. So the other 10 brothers who did this to Joseph, who, you know, put him into slavery, who lied to the dad, were now scared to death of him. Here was the brother they mistreated, who they put into slavery, who they made banished from, from his family. Now, they put him into many years of rough living, is now before them. And Joseph now was not only before him, but he was now the number two guy in Egypt. He had the power to imprison them. He had the power to cast them into slavery, or even worse, the power to execute them for the sins they committed against him. However, what did Joseph do? He granted them mercy instead of vengeance. Joseph was able to see throughout those years God's divine hand and all that happened to him. He put himself second in this situation and remembered God's mercy for him during all those years first. As God granted him mercy and favor, he did the same thing for his brothers. Unlike the unforgiving servant in Matthew 18, God had preserved Joseph for all those years in slavery and prison through his faithfulness in God to put him in that exact position in that day to grant mercy and to preserve his family. God had promised to his great-grandfather Abraham that he would make him a great nation. And what Joseph saw throughout the years and through the situation, that God put him in that position to fulfill that promise to his great-grandfather that God made. And God's mercy and grace towards him was the mechanism to do it. So as we see in, in Genesis, later in Genesis chapter 50, if you actually want to start turning that way to the Genesis 50, Jacob dies. And when Jacob dies, the brothers are now worried that their dad's not there anymore and Joseph doesn't have to keep them alive. And Joseph would now for sure punish them for the sins that they committed against them. But if we look at Genesis chapter 50, verses 19 and 21, it states, Joseph said to them, do not be afraid for am I in the place of God? But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people's lives. Now therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Here again, as we see, Joseph granted mercy instead of punishment and revenge. He left any judgment to his family in this instance to God and instead gave them love, compassion, and grace. Joseph knew who God was and trusted in God to work all things out, just as it states in Romans 8.28. Now, as we look at the story of Joseph, on that note, let's go back to Matthew 18. Let's go read the last verse of our study tonight. So as we go back to Matthew 18, we're going to go back to verse 35, which is our last verse. And Jesus states, as the parable ends, now Jesus kind of adds to this parable. And he states, So my heavenly Father also will do to you if each of you from his heart, and underline from his heart, does not forgive his brothers his trespass. The point of Jesus' warning here is that God has forgiven us for such a great debt, the debt of our sins, 
Instead of receiving justice and punishment that we so rightfully deserve, we receive mercy and grace from God. As a result of God's mercy, any debt or offense against us is insignificant in comparison if we really look at it. You know, God has forgiven us for so much that even the small or potentially big offenses against us are no, no comparison. Really, they're not. So Jesus in this parable is talking to and warning the believers in him. He is saying that there are many sincere Christians who withhold forgiveness uh, against others for mistaken reasons. They may even justify in their mind that they have valid reasons not to forgive somebody, not to grant mercy. But let's be frank here. Now we know those in the world, those who don't know Jesus, you know, their lives is, is a completely different thing. For them, granting mercy and granting grace can be a challenge at times. We see that. People hold, they, you know, they get vengeful against people. They cut people out of their lives. You know, nowadays you just get cut out of something if you say the wrong thing. You know, that's, that's what they do. There's a vengeance in them. You know, for us though, as believers in Christ, it can be a challenge or test to us. You know, remember I told you about my former pastor of flexing our grace muscle, right? We've got to always remember to do that here, to flex that grace muscle. But in a believer, our changed heart and our changed life should be making it easier and easier for us to forgive and grant mercy through Jesus. So I would like to quote David Guzik one more time here uh, because I think he summed up this verse really well. And he states, it would be wrong to make this into the idea that unforgiveness itself is the unforgivable sin. It is better to say that forgiveness is evidence of truly being forgiven and that habitual unforgiveness may show that a person's heart has never really been touched by the love of Jesus. So those who will absolutely not forgive others should not expect forgiveness. Or as we go back to James 2, verse 13, as I read earlier, judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. So as, as we look at this, you know, as you, you kind of look at God here, and I said at the beginning, God is merciful, and he is. God grants so much mercy to us in this world, it's, it's unbelievable. You know, and I've heard many people say throughout the years that, you know, the God of the Old Testament was angry and vengeful, and the God of the New Testament is love and mercy and grace, and they almost equate to it as being two separate gods. Now, we know that's not the case, God is faithful. God never changes. But as we can see here through our verse this night, from Genesis through Joseph, the first book of the Bible, to Matthew, the first book of the New Testament, all the way to Revelation, God's mercy is unchanging. God's mercy is there for us, always reaching out for us. You know, we are that servant who owe him so much, and we got on our knees, and we begged through mercy through Jesus, and it was granted for us. So as we go about our walk and our life, we must always remember that. You know, God's mercy is so huge. Think of yourself as that person who owed all those talents to, the, to your king, and the king forgave you. So for those who sin against us, who those may anger us, and it happens, right? You know, people are people. People are going to get in our nerves. It's going to happen. We're going to have to flex that grace muscle from time to time and uh, work on it better. But we should always come back to what the word says. And it commands us to be merciful and graceful. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for your mercy on us, Lord. The mercy that we do not deserve, Lord. The mercy that we do not earn. But Lord, that you granted us to us through your Son. Lord, we just thank you for your love, your kindness, your mercy, your long-suffering for us, Lord. I pray tonight, Lord, that all of us, wherever we're at, Lord, may you strengthen us in our grace towards others. Strengthen us in forgiveness, Lord. Strengthen our patience and strengthen, strengthen us to grant mercy to those around us, Lord. And as we go about this world and our feet get dirty every day as we walk in this world, Lord, whether it be in our cars, on, at work, with our families, wherever it is, Lord, may you strengthen mercy in us, Father. May our mercy grow and just come to be as yours is to us, Lord. Speak to our hearts, Lord. Bless us. We thank you for this time in your word, Lord. I pray that uh, it touched our hearts, that you spoke to us, and you blessed us. 
And we pray this to you in Jesus' name. Amen.